I'm Sean Chandler. I'm Jerry. And so last year, Stranger Things came out. I'd never even seen a trailer for it. I didn't know anything about it until it was already released. And then suddenly, everyone was talking about it. I watched it, uh, and I loved it. Yeah. It was amazing. Now, you ah. are kind of infamous for not liking anything. Nothing. Uh, you, you quoted... Cause, so he goes to the movies with me most Thursday nights, and you're quoted as saying to someone... I have not liked the movie in theaters since 2012. Dread. Yes, it, it is a bit of an exaggeration, but that is not far off from the truth. But Stranger Things, mm. you like everyone else. Love yeah. Stranger Things. Why yeah. is this the thing that popped out that's the thing you actually like? The fact that Stranger Things does something that you rarely see movies or television shows uh, do most of the time now. And that's a uh, try. <laughs> that's, that's really it. But anytime you get the story... That's great. With Stranger Things, you got the story. They understand they've got to take care of the writing. The lines have to be good. The music has to be good. The cinematography has to be good. When you hit all the notes, you hit all the notes in the song just right. Uh, people, I know, I've been, I've been labeled cynical. I've been labeled a hater. And by you, by the way. But it's true. Yeah, you did. It's <laughs> negative, I believe, is the word. And, uh, and that hurt a little. <laughs> but, but, you know, I love you, so, you know. Uh, I can't resist, you know, that face, you know. Anything, no matter what, it doesn't matter how thin or thick or deep a story is, as long as you have stories, as long as you have a rich narrative. That, to me, is when you can make it fire on all on all four eight cylinders. I don't know anything about cars. Neither do I. Some amount of cylinders, that's when you pull it off. And, and, and that's... I kind of for me too. Just I started watching it, and it's yes. like, wow, these are kid actors that mm-hmm. are actually really good, right. and they're acting like actual kids. Yeah. That theme music at the beginning. I just love, love yes. that theme music. Yeah, capturing '80s nostalgia right. It doesn't feel like a caricature of the '80s. It felt like that decade mm-hmm. we actually lived in. Mm-hmm. It felt right, and so all of us loved it. Mm-hmm. Now we get to season two. Mm-hmm. All of the things I just said about season one, that's all still true of season two, but right, we had different right. reactions to we the did. season we did. in general. And so you kind of loved it. I was very frustrated with it, and we yeah. were working together because yes. we were in the same place. We started talking about it, and I was like, we got to just film this one because we, right. we have such different yes. takes on this season. Now, before we dive into it and give our thoughts on it, mm-hmm. be sure you put your thoughts down below in the comments section. Let us know, did you live it? Did you hate it? Were you frustrated by it? Were you somewhere in the middle? I'm guessing this season's going to be pretty divisive, and people are going to be kind of all over the place on where they fall on this one. So tell us down below what you thought about it. Also, where can we find you on the internet? Right now, uh, I'm part of a small startup company. We're trying to develop our own role-playing games. Uh, you can find uh, where we are at the at these spaces right here. Uh, that are it's supposed to be in front of Sean. That's I'm gonna, there we go right there. There we go. Now I've got it. Uh, just follow those links right there. So be sure to check them out. Follow their stuff over there. Links are on the screen. They're down in the description. We'll talk more about it at the end of this video. Now, as we go into this, here's how it's going to work. We're going to give our each of our general impressions. We're going to respond to each other's general impressions. We're both going to talk about what we thought was good, and then we're going to go through the main plot lines of it. And this is spoilers all the way through. If you haven't watched the season yet, why are you watching this video? Go watch the season. Even me as the guy that's going to be really critical of it, go watch it. It's worth watching, even for all my frustration, anger, with the direction they took some things, you need to watch it. Yeah. So with that said, as the guy that loved it, can you build a case for, in about a minute, mm-hmm. why should we love this season? Well, I went into it like everyone else, and I said to myself, all right, that's the biggest problem of any television show that is a hit. What are you going to do with season two? As we've seen on most regular television networks, they can kill with the first yep. season, and most of the time, season two is not does not deliver, and the fans let you know, and they let you know fast. This group of people, these actors, these writers, these producers, they knew what they had to do. They went for a, se- a second season that, to me, felt kind of like the pacing of Empire Strikes Back. Mm-hmm. The similarities are... In this case, instead of one group of people experiencing something and you see them kind of progressing forward, in this case, we take the group and we have everybody in a different angle, in a different place, scattered about. Mm -hmm. And so when you count that, very quickly we see all these people, all of our characters that we love and new characters spread out 
having to deal with their own individual problems as they try to deal with the big overall problem of what's going on. And then at the last handful of episodes, what I feel makes it work, just like in Empire Strikes Back, all of our characters that are scattered with their own stories while dealing with the big overall story come back together all to deal with the main problem. Now, it, of course, doesn't have the wonderful dark ending that Empire has, you know. Can't have everything, and we can't do a shout, do every kind of shout-out. <laughs> and you can't, can't kill kids. This gets a little bit tricky. We with can't that. cut children's hands off. Cats are okay, that, but... Don't, yeah. <laughs> For some people. All right, so on, on my end, if I were to kind of... Yeah. Why did I think it was... Very disappointing. Very frustrating for me. And I, part of it, mm -hmm. it's not the individual details. It's mm -hmm. the combination of all the different things. Mm -hmm. Even with, like you said, going with that darker Empire Strikes Back, let's split up the team. Mm -hmm. The way they did those ingredients, you took, mm -hmm. uh, when the season starts off, everyone's got post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. We bring in a new bully kid. Mm -hmm. that we, you know, He's horrible. We find out he's abused. Right. Uh, we've got Eleven just shouting at her surrogate father, dad. And then we break them up into their groups and we put like the two most brooding people together on a journey together and so then there's like this brooding corner over here you've got Eleven on a journey where surrogate dad fails her uh, aunt fails her <laughs> she makes some new friends and they want her to kill people yes <laughs> and so it, it, it just got kind of it's not the individual scenes, it's not the individual moments, but it's like we're bathing in so much mm -hmm. just conflict negative that seemed to squeeze out so much of the fun mm -hmm. that was there before. Right. And that for kind of me is where uh, it just kind of lost me a little bit because it was so scattered in different directions and frustrating. And to kind of to kind of rebut your kind of statement as to mm -hmm. it's like Empire, it's mm -hmm. all these possible things, it felt to me... Mm -hmm. Like, if you took the ideas that they wrote, like, you have uh, Eleven, and she's never dealt with these things before, mm -hmm. and so then, what if she's dealing that with it, and she's alone, mm -hmm. and as she feels alone, mm -hmm. she is alone, and she's on a journey to alone. Mm -hmm. Like, in a writer's room on the wall, like, you're writing that up on the whiteboard, that yeah. sounds great. Mm -hmm. And then, when you have everything like that, it starts to feel distant. It starts to feel frustrated, like... It, watching it all together. Mm -hmm. Like, what if they're, let's make this grounded. How would pe team kids actually have to respond to mm -hmm. all of this? Yes. So like, oh, that sounds good. Until so you're watching it and you're like, oh man, 13 year olds with post traumatic stress disorder and a, and a, a surrogate father that's not great at it. And, and telekinetic power. And, tele and, like, and just, they're all shouting at each other and it just squeezed all yeah. of the excitement out of it. Mm -hmm. And then it just, because they, were, they added, Everybody returned, and they added new characters into it, and you went, mm -hmm. oh, this sounds like we'll have this new girl in it, and we'll mm -hmm. have this. All of them on paper, on the whiteboard, mm -hmm. sound like good ideas. All in one season, mm -hmm. it feels too disjointed, and it feels like two different seasons worth crammed into one, and so then mm -hmm. they cut off certain storylines in the middle of it, came mm -hmm. back to it, and it's like just felt like a bunch of ideas on a whiteboard. Mm -hmm that all made it in when mm -hmm. half of them should have made it. That would be kind of my rebuttal to kind of what, what you said about it. I, that's where I do disagree. That's the biggest disagreement is that, yes, I do agree with the fact that it does feel like you're, you're seeing the writer's room and they're putting the ideas on the board. But, and I'm going to, but, you know, I'm going to admit I have a bias. I'm going to admit my bias in this, and maybe it's because I have this bias that, allow, that I, I like it so much. I like being able to see the wheels turning in the writer's head. I love to see where they're going. There were a lot of places where I could see where things were going, but it didn't ruin it for me. It's not like me, the typical thing where I'm like, oh, great, here comes typical cliche at this moment. They were able to do it in a way where I was like, oh, I see what's happening. It's, oh, yeah. oh, very nice, very well done. And so in this case, uh, you have a fair point, and... I admit that if I disagree, I have to disagree uh, knowing that I am automatically biased because I just loved watching all these different angles, all these different ideas playing out together. Uh, under normal circumstances, I would agree with you 100%. Uh, I feel it would have completely fallen on its face and fallen apart, but I'm just so proud of this crew, this cast, these writers, the Duffer brothers, these wonderful kid actors. They just make it work. All right. So before we start diving into all the specifics mm -hmm. of the main plot and everything mm -hmm. like that, let's start off with the good. And so 
I'm going to say a bunch of negative things Mm -hmm. eventually. So I'll start off on my positives. Mm -hmm. Right off the bat, everything, all the general things about the show, Mm -hmm. the music, the 80s nostalgia, the feeling like what a Halloween was like. Yes. Um, Yes. I heard uh, someone complain on the internet that some some of these millennials are like, parents would never let kids be out that long. Parents would worry for so much. Like, no, no, you don't don't know what it was like growing up in the 80s and the 90s. A lot has changed in the last 30 years of like just what was normal. For mm-hmm. how long you could just leave, yes. go over to his friend's house, and yes. no one would think anything of it. Mm-hmm. This whole cell phones, parents knowing, where they, like that's all new. That's the exactly. last fifteen or twenty years, yeah. and so just that it feels like you're in the eighties. It, it feels does. like a movie that would have come out in the eighties. Yeah, um, it looks great. The way it's directed, mm-hmm. um, and the way they cut mm-hmm. between scenes. There's just so many places in it where like someone walks up to a door and they open the door, and then we cut to a new scene. Yes, and it's it yes. just the whole thing. It's just so well packaged, mm-hmm. thought through. It's not just willy nilly. It's not just standard. Hey, mm-hmm. I bought. I read the book at film school on how to direct a scene. Right? No, it's right. it's like a distinct style that ran through all the episodes mm-hmm. a tone that sits throughout all the episodes yes um the kids still great um so that's the general things that just continues to be true of the show yes. specifics to this one mm-hmm. uh steve just mm-hmm. kind of pops out steve. so so you at the first yes. season you're like steve's kind of a douchebag mm-hmm. and then this season steve pops out steve's awesome yes he's insane he's awesome <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it, 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 so the movie came out on um, mm-hmm. Netflix a couple weeks ago called The Babysitter. Yes. And that one had the coolest babysitter <laughs> of all time. It was a hot chick. Right. And in this yes. one, Steve is this super hot, yes, Steve. cool guy. With, this, with the excellent hair. With excellent hair. Way better hair than that crazy babysitter that wanted to sell a kid's soul to Satan. So. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And then running around with a baseball bat, yeah. fighting all sorts of monsters yeah. in it. In which case, Netflix, you guys, you're you're yeah. like knocking out of the park when it comes to cool babysitters. Yeah. I was just thinking, if these two babysitters yeah. were to get married and have kids together, those would be beautiful kids that are very, very cool. But yeah. I mean, it looks. I feel strange. that's your Stranger Things spinoff, yes. Steve Monster Hunter. Yes. He's a babysitter monster. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's all sorts yes. of potential in that. Yeah. Um, I love seeing Paul Reiser in there. Yes. Love Paul seeing Reiser. Sean Astin in it. Like, I didn't know they were in it. So the opening yeah. credits of the first episode ran, I was like, they're in this? And yes. they were, they were yes. great. And then yes. even whether that's playing the mm-hmm. the lovable or the the awkward mm-hmm. new dad figure in the family mm-hmm. that is awkward, mm-hmm. but that they let him just be a good guy. Yeah. And they didn't they didn't have to like give us a negative. They didn't have to justify that we're killing him off. They didn't have to do anything. Like that. They mm-hmm. actually let a man be a good father figure. Yes, yes. And die heroically. Yes. And I there's a side to me that's like, wait, the, like the one most noble character person in this whole thing. Yes. They killed that guy off. Yes. But at the same time, yeah. It fit. It fit with the fact that he's a legitimately a good guy. Yes. He would put himself in that situation, mm-hmm. and that ha- can have consequences. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought he was great. Paul Reiser, that yes. he's in that government role yes. that you don't trust him. He's sleazy. Right. Yes. Um, yes. But he's not full alien sleazy. He's he's still mm-hmm. fun, charismatic Paul Reiser right. while being— And he this- surprises us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He surprises he, us. He's not just kind of clear-cut where he's at from beginning into you're like, right. oh, you're— you're not just this horrible, horrible guy. Right. Uh, so, I mean, think, yeah. uh, um, there's just some great action in it, too. Great. All, the, yes. the, all these demon monster things, that provided a lot of yeah. opportunity. Yes. Th- those are, what are the ones that, obviously, you're going to have, where I go into my negatives, you'll have a lot of positive saying those. What are the things that just popped to the most as, as awesome? As, as far as the new characters go? Any of it. Anything Any about this, uh, uh, in general, if I missed anything about the series as a whole. Oh, what did you love about this? It's, it's so hard. It's I, I just loved everything. I, I just one second after another. I'd, when you have good dialogue, I'm mm-hmm. loving watching the kids argue and talk and their awkwardness. And, you know, while we're dealing with the fact that, you know, an evil lord from another dimension is trying to break into you know a doorway in Indiana. Is that creature Cthulhu? Uh, it's a Cthulhu like creature. Uh, the Duffer brothers knew that they were dealing with. With they wanted a character that was like, as they said, Lovecraftian. Lovecraft, yeah. 
and you know. We're, so having watched The Mist like a month ago, yes. I was watching a bunch of this like, this is so like The Mist yeah. in parts, which yeah. is a very... that's Why do you think Stephen King got it? Yep. Yes, everybody steals from Lovecraft. I'll, I'll steal from Lovecraft. And you know what? Lovecraft is fine with that. He's dead and he's still fine with it. Are other great th- other things you loved about this one? Oh my goodness! Uh, really, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, it was Steve. Steve was yep. Steve was a great one. Yeah, it's uh, uh, Bob. I, I loved uh, the whole bit with Bob. Supposedly, it's uh, Sean Astin. Uh, it was intended to be a smaller part, and then Sean Astin comes mm-hmm. in, reads for the part, makes it bigger. Yeah. The you know the producer and the Duffer Brothers, are like, we've got to make him bigger. Mm-hmm. And I love the fact that. Uh, people for the longest time were asking it's like we want uh, Barb to be alive please is Barb alive and the producer willingly in an interview said no she's mm-hmm. dead and that's what I love is not only is Barb and I love how the message was cut not only is Barb dead we're going to create Bob and we're going to kill Bob how do you like that it was just a clear message but that I guess that's the best scene overall for me because Bob's death we see it before it happens. We see the moment he looks at Winona Ryder's character. He looks at Joyce. Joyce looks back at him. You know it's coming. Under any circumstances, in any movie theater at home, I would go, oh, brother, just kill him already because I hate cliches completely. But because the season was so well, I, my, I, I suspended my disbelief. I was in there. That's all I want. I want to make a willing suspension of disbelief. I want to be following the story. I'm into it. So the moment we see it's about to happen... All I am actually looking at the screen just what no Brad Bob no the door. So before we move off from Bob, that was spoiled for me on the, on Twitter. Uh-huh. Uh, Collider.com. Mm-hmm. Been reading you guys comedy supporting you, and then you failed me. Like they in the headline, Bob's fate was originally supposed to happen much earlier in the season, and mm-hmm. they just put it in the headline three days yeah. after. So, anyways, that yeah. one was spoiled for me. I was angry about that. I, yeah, anyway, but other <laughs> you need to get off social media. That's what it's, I. It, it doesn't work when you have one of these YouTube channels, know, and they yeah. should know better. Yeah. Uh, other one I forget. Positive uh, mm-hmm. investigator guy. I don't know the oh, actor's yeah, name. Yeah, we always uh, forget his name. Don't we? I, I love this guy. I, I just know him as shaved from the <laughs> other guys. That was just that joke. From, <laughs> it's my favorite thing from the other guys is that guy yeah. going. I bet you, because you see the beard, you think I'm a hairy guy. Shaped. <laughs> just love that joke. <laughs> um, and then he was in this, and just as quirky and weird as he is and everything else, yes, and yes. fun and funny, and just yeah. made this character that could have been like uh, just yeah. this kind of staunchy uh, investigator guy, yes. gave him this whole, or conspiracy theory. Yes. It made him, you could be legitimate while being weird, uh, and, and that made him work on a different right. level. Any yeah. other final things you just loved about this one? And we can talk about it later on. We but could, general. but yeah, it would just take too long. It was so much they did, and I just, I was, I was along for the ride the whole way. Yeah. All right, so from there, we'll move on to... The characters in general, the ones we haven't talked about. So we talked about Bob a lot. We talked about Steve a lot. Let's talk about some of the other ones. We added Max into the mix. We added Billy the Bully into it. Um, So what what was your take on some of the new characters and the old characters? Who's your favorites besides Steve and Shaved and Paul Reiser? (laughs) Um, I enjoyed enjoyed the character of Max. I thought, yes, let's, let's get another girl into the group. And she served her purpose. We'll get to know her. Did they do? Could they have done more with her? Maybe, maybe. I'll give it, but I like how we're introducing her, and we'll. They'll, I think they'll do more with her in season three. Right now, we we just had to serve a certain plot device that the boys are becoming men. They're getting interested in girls. So me, kind of, you know, the thirty something is like, oh, to be young again, you know, all that, and uh, you know, uh, Billy. I like Billy just because of the purpose that he served. You had something about Max. Uh, Both of them, actually. Mm -hmm. I guess my take to what my general feeling of the whole thing just felt Mm -hmm. soaked in conflict and negativity. And conflict, Mm -hmm. obviously, makes for good drama, makes for good storytelling. But that everyone is in conflict with each other. Everyone has a dramatic backstory. Yeah. It's not that I didn't like Billy. It's not that I didn't like Max. Mm -hmm. It's that when you have a season where our main characters that were so fun and youthful innocence the previous Mm season Mm -hmm. are now dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, literally, that's that's stated. That's yes, not me doing pop true. psychology. No, it's yeah. stated in the show that that's, yes. that's their mental state, and that seems to be a theme of it, the different ways that people deal with mm. actual traumatic events. Right. So you've already got characters that are really heavy, mm. and then you add into it 
a very dysfunctional two new characters. One yes. of them is a very clearly abused male yes. turning into an, a bully and an abuser out of it. Yes. Um, and and they also added some a little bit of creepy undertones with him, him fl- hitting with, on a mom. I was like, how far are they going to go with him? Like. Yeah. googly eyes with it, like knowing that he himself is 22 and legal it's like okay but when you're watching it it was like mm-hmm. he's supposed to be in high school this is this mm-hmm. is going a little bit too far down this path um yeah. but that when you add them in and they have such weight to them right if it, it, that's the the context that's that yeah. mix i was talking about of right. where it gets frustrating but in and of themselves the performances right. were great i mean right. of like billy as this guy mm-hmm. that you you hate him and mm-hmm. you think he's kind of cool and he's like actually like is this creepy scene i'm talking about he's yes. pulling it off yes like <laughs> and that's yes. kind of what makes it so creepy is you're like right. This is really happening, and I'm buying it in the worst possible ways because um, he's so good at it. And he I'm trying to figure out where do I recognize this guy from. The only other thing I've seen him in was he was the Red Ranger in the Power Rangers movie this year, which he was good oh, in that too. Yeah. Um, I, I thought he's familiar too. I looked. I tried to look up. Uh, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't know him. He's brand new. Mm-hmm. And then uh, kind of going through our characters. So some of the ones I really didn't like this season. What they did, or how far they kind of went in the negative. Uh, Nancy. Uh, yeah. I just thought. Mm-hmm. Because of the way she was dealing with things, she just she's mm-hmm. so like we're we're falling in love with Steve. <laughs> we're the way they wreck Steve, <laughs> yeah. and she's just treating like garbage. And you're watching like the best Steve there is mm-hmm. throughout the whole season. Mm-hmm. Even in a breakup, mm-hmm. he's he's like oh man, he's he's being pretty classy and all this. Yeah, and so you're watching her at her worst throughout the whole season. Yeah, which. If it was, if she was just the only character like that, it'd mm-hmm. be one thing. But when it's in the context of everything else, it just made her really unlikable. Mm-hmm. And then you put her with the introvert character, that's uh, Jonathan, Jonathan recluse yes. guy. Yeah. In which case, those two together, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. This there wasn't the, the energy that you have in almost every other kind of of the. There's not the charismatic one mm-hmm. in those two on an adventure together. Yeah. You were a little bit more positive on the two of them. Yes, and, and you know, as I've thought about it all day, you've those are those are fair points, and I have to say that it only works in this case. I feel for uh, two reasons. Uh, one is because uh, the fans, a lot of the fans, they wanted it to happen. Yeah, the, you know, they they. They had Jonathan and Nancy together in season one. At the end, they pull them apart and make her go and make her go with Steve at the end of season one. So the fans are wanting Jonathan and Nancy to get to get together. So I feel it, it's uh, it's what J.J. Abrams said uh, when he was when he was putting together the first Star Trek film. And it's like all of a sudden I have he has to do an alternate dimension and he has to put these same exact people mm-hmm. on one ship together in a two-hour film, yeah. and he knows at a certain point the fan is going to go, really, how is this all coming together? And his answer is simply, because you want it to come together. Yeah. This is, we want something to happen. So I feel the the producer and the Duffer Brothers, they get out on that. The other thing is that it's a good, it's a good plot device uh, because it's helping Nancy to realize that uh, she does like Steve, but she truly does feel a certain way for Jonathan. And I admit, Nancy was kind of fell victim to plot devices in season two more than she did in season one. In this case, her purpose was she was trying, you know, her thing, or she spent season two trying to get justice for Barb and resolving her feelings with Steve and Jonathan. Mm-hmm. And I admit, they kind of, you know, they kind of confined her to that area. And then once those were resolved, then it's time to go back to the team at the end. Yeah. And if they weren't doing so much, and if they weren't, if the writing wasn't so good, if the conflict wasn't so wasn't so good at what they did, uh, I admit they probably wouldn't have pulled it off. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll get it. I was going to go into a story thing. We'll get into the story things mm-hmm. in just a little bit. So, kind of our kind of last few people. Winona Ryder. Mm-hmm. I, I think she's always she's, good in these. Yes. She's given this very solid performance. Yes. She feels like. She's just there, though, though, to me. And I don't say there's a criticism of her performance. The character, yeah. as written, is is more mm-hmm. the mom character. And well, yeah. They haven't. They, they didn't give the mom character a, a thing that pops. She just feels like, what would a mom do in this situation? But she'd look like that. And they gave her Bob. I mean, that's that's. But she like, gave her Bob. And yeah, and they so gave Bob. Her Bob. And then they took Bob away from her. That's what I, I loved about it was they they gave her Bob and they took Bob away from her. 
And so, you know, I don't know. Just uh, it's very difficult for Winona Ryder to disappoint me in this series. She and that's not a di- yeah. disappoint's not the word. It's yeah. more doesn't pop is the word that. Uh, okay. And so then from there we go to just our batch of the boys. Um, yeah. Which yes. who's your favorite of the boys? Uh it's it's because uh, they're children. It's hard. It's like trying to decide who's your favorite kid. You know, you have. A that's wife. easy for me to say. Yeah. I don't, you know, it's so it's a little hard. Wait, to I'm on camera. Shouldn't answer. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's 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 tough. It's tough because I I I love uh, Mike because you know just I, I love that 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 you know he's 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 brave and I love the fact that at that age I did not have the guts to shove a man like John Hopper and talk back to him. I would never have done. I, I was like, "Oh, this kid's got guts. He's probably about to get killed, but he's got guts." Yeah. Uh, Lucas, I, I love him because, in a way, I love him because of the thing things he does that irritate me, and that's that he's very stubborn. He's very determined, but I admire that. I admire that. Uh, I admire that de- determination. I respect that. Uh, Dustin does hold a special place for me. I, I love uh, because uh, he's. He's the kid who he is kind of the kid on the outside. Even in the group of, you know, nerds, the group of outsiders, he's kind of the one that, you know, everybody looks at and goes, oh, that, oh, him. And I love the fact that, I, I, I love the fact that he is who he is at such a young age. Yeah. Just, and he's going to be who he is. And, I, you know, and that's also why it, it does so well for me at the end of, Season two to see Nancy go up and, and dance with him like that. I'm like, you know, that, you know, it, it does my heart. It it it, it does something for that, you know. Um, so I, I think for me with the kids, uh, I'm not quite sure what if this is true or not, or just having off memories of season one. Mm-hmm. I felt like we didn't get as much of the rapport of the group of the boys together as much. Well, no, no and no. because some because they're split apart because yeah. Eleven wasn't there. Yes, and so I think some of the stuff that I was liked about it and I wonder how much also is just tainted by having seen it two months ago and then having strong rapport in that and yeah. one of them being the yeah. same actor yeah, you, yeah. Um, the, you want some feelings about that we'll you know make another segment he has he has not liked the movie since Dread in 2012 since that means he Dread did not like it a couple months ago but so yeah, I probably absolutely. lost a little bit like I didn't feel as much of that mm-hmm. um, this, going back to that sense of fun Mm-hmm. That was them together, season one. That was mm-hmm. so fun, so surprising. And when it didn't seem like we had as much of that, it was a lot more conflict. It was. Pulling yes. apart. Yes. Uh, some of that stuff that kind of drew me in is missing from it. All right, so we talked a lot about the characters. Mm-hmm. Let's move on to just the... Interge- well, actually, Hopper. One final character. John Hopper. You had... You know, Jim Hopper. You had thoughts on him. starts with a J. <laughs> That's, I, I don't know what it is. I believe um, it's Jim Hopper. You had thoughts on him mm-hmm. in uh, our work conversation earlier. Yeah, uh, just uh, I love uh, you know things about him that have to do with uh, the time period the Stranger Things is set in, and things that they they did that they it's always like I say it's always great in a story whether reading a book watching a film anything whenever the writers will show you something and uh, they'll tell you something without just coming out and yeah. say it they'll play something for you to see and recognize that's always the best type of writing that there is. Uh, like Billy's a bully and yes. he's a racist, but right. they never say he's a racist. Right. Just, exactly. You're watching yeah. it and everyone goes, well, yeah. this guy's a racist. And the way that they put it together, how he mistreats Max, uh, it, it just, it, 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 you know, let me see the writers going, oh, and, and I realized, oh, he's probably got an abusive father. Yeah. And knowing where they were going, and I love that. With uh, Hopper, it's the whole thing of how people forget that if we're going by the actor, David Harbour's his name? David, yeah. David Harbour? Hellboy. Hellboy. Yeah. We're going, I'm going to see it just because he's in it. Just for you, David. <laughs> just for you. It's, I'm a huge Guillermo del Toro fan, but it's for you, David. But, okay, I'm sorry. It's, uh, uh, yeah, because Hopper, uh, I'm trying to get my train of thought, do it back on my train of thought, but uh, Hopper, uh, it's 1984. Hopper, if we go by David Harbour's age, he's 42 years old. Yes. Born in 42. Which means born in 42. So this is a post-war baby boomer. And I love. there's a scene in the cabin. We see Eleven uh, pulling up all these different boxes that I like how they're kind of like the aspects of Hopper's life. 
uh, there's there's the stuff that he has about her from the Hawkins lab. There's the stuff he has about his daughter Sarah, and then I love it without needing anything for two seasons of Stranger Things. One box, all it has to say on it, Vietnam. Yeah. Always the undercurrent. Hopper is a Vietnam vet. He's a post war per a post war child, which means he grew up in a home probably where so much can tell about. It. This is a person who he doesn't like expressing his feelings. He when he's met with a challenge, he's combative. He has a big heart, but I love that because I could. It's using nostalgia to tell a story. Yeah. So many, so many similarities between family members that I grew up with, people that I knew, who they seem stern, they seem tough. If you didn't know them, you'd think that they were just you know these mean individuals. And if, but if knowing them, you realize they have just the the biggest hearts. Yeah. And just I, I love I love that it's I guess that's why I like the conflict there because Eleven is arguing it at, at him and he it's just in his nature to argue back and it just it's so wonderful when they resolve that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So moving along, mm. we talked to, with the characters. We touched on a lot of this stuff, so we can probably move a little bit quicker on some of this. But mm. the main kind of plot line it's at so the much. city with Will. We actually didn't talk about Will all that much, but the yeah. city, Will, the upside yeah. down, mm-hmm. all the main storyline of mm-hmm. what's going on in the city. Yeah. Uh, I didn't. Ne- I didn't necessarily have any huge issues with that. That wasn't the area where I had issues. Right. I was more. That because it was distracted in other directions, mm-hmm. that's where um, the character type things I think struggled, and mm-hmm. I was less invested in those other plot lines. Mm-hmm. This main one, uh, as a Stranger Things type plot line, mm-hmm. I mean, it set up government conspiracies, but in a different type of way. Yeah, crazy, weird visuals. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't. There's a little bit of the exorcism, demon possession side yeah. to the way they did the will stuff as a theme, and that's what I love about once again seeing the writers working right there. They and they said that on the interviews is we were going with possession. We just didn't want to get too deep into it. And it's and I haven't seen those interviews, but that's yeah. I mean they, that's within. I wasn't crazy about the demon possession sort of idea to it mm-hmm. but I didn't hate it either right. um, and it, it it the specific influences of demon possession mm-hmm. it, as, as opposed to just kind of mind control symbiotic mm-hmm. relationship that it was obviously demon possession mm-hmm. the final episode very clearly was an yes. exorcism yes I went, that's where I was like this feels a, a bit out of place mm-hmm. the way you're doing this mm-hmm. but in general that wasn't my, my big issues mm-hmm. kind of with it and it mm-hmm. set up that whole plot line mm-hmm. great stuff with Steve as the babysitter with the baseball bat yes this yes. great death uh, for Bob yes um, uh, different environments for things to take place a setup yeah. for mm-hmm. at episode 9 yes for 11 to finally yes. <laughs> show up yes. and yes. Um, use the awesome powers that we've been waiting to see this whole time yes so there's a whole bunch of things in the main plot line that are like Mm-hmm. Yeah, anything to expand on that or issues with the main plot line? Yes, uh, the big the big thing is I understand your feelings about the possession. Uh, the reason why I guess I like the idea of the possession so much is something John Carpenter said going back to Lovecraft as always. Uh, when people asked him how he felt about uh, Lovecraft's great character, the Dark Lord Cthulhu, and he talks about how he says, and John Carpenter says, if you ever came as close as you could to getting a well-rounded character that described the aspect of the devil it's Lord Cthulhu and that's what I loved about how they pulled in when people pull in Lovecraft that's how you do it right uh, Lovecraft was always trying to balance between the mystical and the scientific that is it is it an alien from deep space is it a demon from another realm and I love how his his thought is in a way it is both dealing with what we can comprehend. And that's what I love. In a way, it was a possession. In a way, it was this horrible conscious virus, this entity kind of invading this boy's mind. It, it And that's what I like. He ties it together so well. Uh, we got Steve with the bat against oh, our yes, little Steve, creatures. Yeah. Yeah. We got sh- machine gunning down uh, mm-hmm. a bunch of these dog things. Yes, yes. Eleven steps in, and Dark Phoenix yes. is the whole thing. Yeah, that, yeah, that is or the whole thing. Or carries the whole thing. Yeah, well, to me, it, you know, it's... It it would normally be a cheesy cliche, and it, and but I've always said if you you can get away sometimes with shout outs and cliches if you do it right. You know we had the characters all out in the middle, and then they're coming back together, and we want it. We want the team back together. Mm-hmm. They they 
you know, I understand why we, we didn't have the camaraderie, we didn't have the team, and they teased it, and they teased it, and they teased it. They kept them apart as long as they could. It's like, all right, now we're going to give you what you want in the last episode. And, you know, I'm I'm there. The You know, the, the demo dogs are coming towards the door, and everybody's got the weapon, everybody's ready, you know, and... We're like, what's going to happen? And then as soon as we see the dead demo dog fly the window, it's like 11. And so speaking of 11, that's our next one on yes. here. 11 in the path to self-discovery is what I wrote down as she mm -hmm. kind of goes on her own journey of her past, her history. Mm -hmm. Who is she? What does she want? Not what have other people told her to do, or do I, but what does she want for herself? Mm -hmm. I would say this is probably the... the the plot line, the direction they decided to take her character is probably the main reason that the season just kind of got soured for me. Okay. Because um, other things, perhaps if it worked out differently, but it felt like a separate season. It mm -hmm. felt like this was should have been the main plot for season three, or this should have been the main plot for this season. Mm -hmm. Um because there was enough in there of it, of, of it in and of itself of mm -hmm. what they were doing with her, and so they took this interesting character, and she her dynamic with the boys is one of the main dynamics of the it whole is. first season. Yeah, and then you have her only dynamic with a consistent character in the season is with, with Hopper, and it's it's yeah. this, so it's yeah. it's conflict, and then yeah. she goes down the road, and it's conflict. And so you don't have the levity to her or the humanity to her. Right. Uh, the, or the fun side of humanity in her character. Right. And then the way they did the episode seven, mm -hmm. where her with the, the warriors, as you said earlier, yes, the, the season kicks off and it has an <laughs> opening scene of these people in Pittsburgh yeah. um, doing crazy stuff. In 1984, in a dark street in a major city, it's real simple, kids. Okay. If you see someone with a mohawk, all right, run. They are not a Lady Gaga fan. Times have changed once again. But so that happens, and then yeah. n nothing on that six full episodes, and then there's a whole episode yeah. dedicated to yeah. basically a whole different plot line from the previous six episodes, yes. yeah. and it felt like a backdoor pilot. It feels like they're like testing the waters to people. Mm -hmm. Do people want to have this kind of superpowered people out for revenge story or um, anti-hero? That's what it felt like because it was such mm -hmm. a... Like, the whole episode is focused on this other thing that's like yeah. if this had been a season I get it but it just feels like why is this we've got this path and then 11's way over here on this path right. and then they come together and the like in the one sense it's oh she has this moment she realizes she needs to go save her friends mm -hmm. but it like you could have you could have taken some of, mm -hmm. maybe you take a couple of the kids and they're off on the adventure with her. Mm -hmm. So she's not in isolation. You give something to give some levity to her storyline right. that ties it back. Or there's, maybe you have that plot line intersect a little bit more with this other plot line of she goes off on her journey of self-discovery because she's like, I'm not going to help this evil government organization. And because she yeah. leaves, it gets out of control and expands. And then finally she has, realizes I'm not a killer. Mm -hmm. And if they'd made, like, we might, I don't know if I would have finished watching it if she'd actually killed someone. They didn't do that. That's not where they're going right, with it. Yeah. But it's like, this is getting so dark and with what they're doing with this. Right. And and so that's for, to, to me, the, the plot was just so heavy mm -hmm. where everything else is heavy. And it was this yeah. offshoot thing over here. Mm -hmm. that It's not that it was a bad idea. It's not that it was a bad plot, mm -hmm. but it felt like its own season. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you this one in, in this case. Uh, before I we got to the end of the show, what I thought was going to happen was I thought that somehow uh, Kali, number eight, was going to be tied into Billy and Max. Mm -hmm. I thought that that, that was going to be like, uh, that they were going to be family members or something, that, that, that Kali was waiting at home, that she'd you know, uh, moved to Indiana with the gang to hide out or something. I thought everything was going to take place in Hawkins. I thought it was going to kind of, you know, be a little bit more of a tight plot. And yes, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we're going to take a trip to Pittsburgh. Yeah. Well, this is, yeah, this was here. Now we're going to go, to, okay, so now we're going to intro introduce that. That is a fair point. And in a lot of circumstances with films, with stories, with anything, yes, that can be a damaging device. It can be. Uh, if uh, Eleven had, you know, gone ahead and killed in cold blood, yes, I understand. I think that would have done damage to the story. I was afraid because I thought, all right, we're going to, they're going to take a character that level, you know, which a lot of people, they want to do. They want to make someone not entirely good, not entirely evil yeah. in conflict and all. What I liked was 
They just needed, uh, I guess this is what, re- it, re- it was redeemed by the fact that she knew she was capable of taking a life if she needed to, because she's killed in self-defense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She, and what I love is that we don't excuse the fact that Eleven wants to kill this guy. She yeah. wants to kill everyone that hurt her mother. She wants to kill them all. She wants to do it, which I like, uh, to me, that's human enough. Acknowledging, you know, in the right circumstance, we would all, we are all capable of horrible things. And we put her, this 13-year-old girl, in this situation. And I love how, and that's why I guess I loved about it. This is how it, re, how it redeemed the story for me. It redeemed the trip to Pittsburgh. And that's that we had a moment where we see Eleven, and for the first time in a long time, in a movie, a television show, I see a demonstration of mercy and meekness, and it's not done in the cliche, no, don't do it, you'll be just like them, don't do it, it it's not the right path, it's, and, you know, some stupid speech that even, you know, it was a cliche, wonderfully broken at the end of Deadpool, as my point right there, you know, it's, you only have so many, bang, you know, no, enough of that, but they took it and they made it work. We understood. We didn't want her to do it. And then I love how there is no impassioned speech. There is just a picture of the man with his children. And um, and she realizes he has children. He's a father. I'd be taking a father from his children. And I love that. Because to me, that that's what they needed to go with her character. Because of that, this very awkward and you know stretched plot line i feel gets a redemption and if they hadn't done it uh i feel that it would have suffered all right so final area to discuss we've got justice for barbara (laughs) and love triangles so on this one it's it's somewhat similar sorts of feelings because Mm -hmm. of the way the season plays out Mm -hmm. it feels like we've got this big gigantic really important urgent thing going on Mm -hmm. And then Eleven's just kind of over here in Pittsburgh and yes. going on meeting family and discovering yeah. herself. And then we've got, hey, we've got to have some payoff for Barbara. Right. So then we have this other path over here. So we got these three different paths going on that I'm going, okay, if this one main line's going on, do we need, like, does it feel right they're spending so much time with these characters going there? Mm-hmm. Especially because it feels like... Oh, she was a fan favorite. We gotta have some resolution. We gotta give more time to that. Mm-hmm. It felt like giving it to the fans too much. Okay. And giving too much time to something that's like, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, you, you could have had one episode about this. Mm-hmm. You could have had one that was kind of resolving it or something like that. Mm-hmm. Or, but it, I mean, it's this plot line for two of the characters go on this journey, meeting with this guy, and then he's mm-hmm. giving him dating advice. And so there's all, basically a whole, uh, after we've already mm-hmm. been writing with them, tracking the story for a little bit, then mm-hmm. we have a whole episode of them hanging out with this guy. Right. Um, and it felt like resolving, spending way too much resol- time resolving a question for the previous one and just providing a context for like, hey, uh, yeah, why don't we share a room? I mean, <laughs> to do this sort of thing. And con- Remember the idea was this, share a room? No, why would we share a room? And you build from there. It, it's, I, it's not one that, if not for, if the 11 one hadn't already felt like, we're going way over here, yes. I'd probably be more forgiving of this one. Uh-huh. Or if they'd given a little bit more of a personality to Nancy that, that wasn't just so brooding and negative. Mm-hmm. Um, in which, like, you're not, I'm not rooting for a girl who clearly is broken and shouldn't be in a relationship. Mm-hmm going into a new relationship with another broken person. Mm. And so it's one of those ones where it's like, I can't, like, I guess this is what we wanted from the last season, but I'm not really rooting for these two people that shouldn't be in a relationship right now to get together because Mm. you've established they're very broken people. Yes. And they're in a new situation where they're going to be even more broken moving forward. Anyway, that was kind of my, um, Mm -hmm. like, it's interesting, the actual way they went about it and with the parents getting an investigator, all that makes sense, but it feels like maybe that's episode one. Maybe that's well, that's the plot line that's going on while all the other people... It felt like the first few episodes were a little bit slow to me mm-hmm. because they were doing all the setup of everything, which is what they were doing. Mm-hmm. And so maybe this could have been the one that could have been moving things a bit mm-hmm. quicker or something like that. Right, right. Anyway, sorry, what are your thoughts? If it weren't for the fact that I realized there's a giant time lapse going on, I might have been more critical of it. Uh, in this case... This, once again, is this happened because the fans wanted it so much. 
And it, I understand when a director or a writer, it's like if the fans really want it, it's it's like if I if I make the characters work for it and earn it, then I'll give the fans what they want. In this case, uh, for Justice for Barb, I remember the interview they were doing with the producer, and I, and that's the one where he said, "No, she's not coming back. She's dead." No. And I liked how that's what he added on. He says one thing we are doing that addresses the. Th- you know the themes that people have had on the net is is because everybody kept hashtagging justice for Barb, and I don't mind that because they could have really really worked hard to bring Barb back to life. They could have done some serious alternate dimension and alternate Barb that flies in from another place and all. You know, but, you know they really could. They or somehow she wasn't actually dead. They find Barb in the upside down. You know, she's like a female Tarzan's been surviving there for over a year. So, there you go. There's our spinoff idea. Yeah, it's you know, it, yeah, they I mean, they could have done things that I feel would have endangered the story a whole lot more if they that's had, true. They if they had done them. So they said, all right, we're not. Go- I like. I don't mind when a producer and writers and direct- and and from they go, we're not going to give you everything you want, but we'll give you this. Here's a little something, and that's fair. I feel. Uh, Normally, yes, I agree. The situation with Nancy and Jonathan, it wouldn't have it, it would have been awkward because yes, they're all they've they're all suffering from PTSD. Uh, Nancy's you know dealing with the conflicts of a relationship, and this is normally unhealthy. And it is one of those few moments. And this is this is what I love. I guess I love most about Stranger Things because so far, it actually it has the ability to make me me <laughs> say. It's a movie. I, I, this is happening because we want it to happen. The, okay, you know, with all the shout-outs they did to different things, that, uh, different movies and shows that they loved in the 80s, the big shout-out to, I feel, to Nancy John, that they worked in, uh, you know, story-wise, was the idea of the the conflict. They want to be together, and they're, Jonathan and Nancy, and they don't want to admit that they want to be together. And it provides a wonderful setup for the conspiracy guy, who, because everybody's pointing it out, and then he's pointing it out, and it gives him some of the best lines of the show. You know, I just, I just love the. Oh, I like Steve, but I don't love Steve. You know, it just, it is just flat out saying, you know, you know, you want to over and over again, and then going back to the shout-out, they're, you know, she's in one room, he's in another room. They're go, they're irritated at what people are saying, uh, and yeah, wonderful little reveal for some of you. Yes. It's called Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Indy's in one room. Willie's in another. Okay. And, you know, I'm a conceited ape. I'll tell you in the morning. It's And, it, and they made it work. And it was a wonderful, you know, bring, it was bringing back the theme in a new way. And, you know, it's because we wanted it and, and because they did it so well. So I will give you that overall. Uh, if they hadn't had such good writing, if they hadn't had such great performances out of the actors, they, they, they pulled it off, and they, they knew they knew that they 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 knew how to pull it off, just so where other shows and other movies would have completely fallen on their faces. On them. And I give you the the yeah. it's the writing of individual scenes, individual yes. dialogues, individual yes. relationships. Yes. It's all as individual things. Mm-hmm. I, I would give it to you. Like, yeah. yeah, it's great writing, great directing, yeah. great way it's yeah. handled, great performances. Mm-hmm. The most ridiculous of plots and stories that would never hold together in the real world have made great films simply because the writing is good, the pacing is good, it, the director and the actors just, it just works. The and, magic happens. And so then for me, this one is to say that the mix of it was off. Mm-hmm. Or there's too many things in the right... Like the, this amount of conflicty, traumatic, stacked on top of each other plot lines, that's where it didn't work for me. For me, season one, definitely better. Mm-hmm. It, for just very distinctly, that's what I would go with. Believe in the magic, Sean. <laughs> Believe in the magic. Don't be like me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just... <laughs> Do you go with season one or season two of Stranger Things is. Which was better? Once again, I'm not going to try and choose between my children, and I'm not going to choose between which is my favorite Star Wars trilogy movie. I love the Star Wars trilogy altogether. I love, I will love Stranger Things altogether if they keep it this way. They're planning for four seasons right now. I think that's a good choice. I don't think there should be necessarily like season seven or season ten 
Really, once these kids graduate high school, I don't know if they can keep the magic. So let's keep it at this wonderful age of childhood. Let's have this wonderful four-season uh, show that's solid, that hits every, th- every right note, and just gives us something to remember. Because we don't have much these days, folks. We don't. Let's keep the magic. Keep the magic. Keep the Let's magic. end on that note right there. So as for me, as I said, very well made, very disappointing. You say keep the magic. Yes. Jerry, mm-hmm. elaborate on where we can find you on the interwebs and kind of what you're up to. Okay, well, uh, the company that I'm working with right now to try and develop a role-playing game that we're hoping we'll put out in early 2018. Uh, if you're trying to figure out uh, this role-playing game, what is Neon Crusade about? Very simple. You go on Netflix, like where you go to see Stranger Things, you find a little thing called Kung Fury, and you watch it, and you stand in amazement. Uh, as for the artists that we're having, because we're not just going to have a core role-playing book, like you see with D&D and so many other role-playing books, we're going to have uh, a little short comic that's going to go inside the role-playing book to give people an idea of, of the story that uh, the stories that they can have, the adventures they can have. It's going to be ridiculous, full of a lot of humor, a lot, a lot of wonderful art done by our artist, Ray Ramos. Uh, the, that's the other thing I want to mention is his Instagram page. Uh, it just goes by... I'll just make this easy for you. The easiest way to find is to go to Instagram and just look up Say Rar. And the Rar are Ray's initials. And you'll see the artwork from uh, the Facebook page for Neon Crusade. And you'll see you'll see it on there. You'll see the artwork for another role-playing game that we're working on. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to be much heavier, much darker. But it's going to take much longer because it's going to be the big, you know, steam engine compared to, you know, the fun little, you know, party game that we're going to do with Neon Crusade. All right. Yeah. Any other things? Uh, no. I mean, thank you for you know just letting us, letting me mention that, and once again, thank you for inviting me on for mm-hmm. the debate. This is this is how we work things out, folks. We 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 talk about we talk it out. We don't fight. We we politely and respectfully disagree, and that's how we make a better world. Speaking of making a better world, if you want to make the world a better place, please consider clicking that subscribe button. Uh, On my channel, I do movie reviews, TV reviews, hey, like the one you're watching right now, ranking videos, but the key thing is I don't want to just talk about movies and TV, I want to talk about them with you, as well as you, Jerry. That's why I had to him on air, but that's why I am in the comment section, I read the comments, I do interact, and I do want to have a lively discussion with you, so join me down there, and thank you so much for watching. He's good.